in the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful. This is the second in a series of programs, and in the last program I presented to you physical evidence that the scripture is God's message to the world. The physical evidence was in the form of a mathematical code that pervades the whole scripture. And I'm talking about the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran. This mathematical system teaches us that every letter, every word is mathematically composed in the scripture beyond human ability, far beyond human ability. And this gives, gives us, gives you confidence that every statement you are going to hear is a proven scientific fact. Every letter, every word in the scripture was written by God and now we have this physical proof, the mathematical code that was discovered by computers recently to let us know that every statement is a proven fact. We now have full confidence in every statement. That program was very important and I hope you watched it because it will let you know that every statement you heard and every statement you will hear in this series of programs is a proven scientific fact. It is very important to have this confidence because many items that we will share with you deal with matter that has been confusing in the past. Now it has become very clear and proven by physical evidence. to deal with the matter of God's love. You heard me open this program by saying, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. And we read in the scripture, the proven word of God, that God is love, that God is peace, that he is the most compassionate, the most merciful. Yet, when we look around us, in this world, we see a lot of misery, a lot of war, oppression. The vast majority of people in the world are suffering from poverty, diseases, starvation, cancer. And the question, the inevitable question that arises is why? If God is loving, compassionate, and merciful, as we read in the scripture, if God is in full control, why do we see all these problems, the earthquakes, the miseries? Why? So as you see, we are dealing with some very heavy material. this episode, I want to illustrate for you the answer to the question, who is God? And remember now that every statement is supported by physical evidence. Let us start with the solar system. If this is the sun, the planets are orbiting the sun in the solar system.
and so on. Now, in this uh, position, our planet Earth is orbiting the sun, and the distance from the sun to our planet is 93 million miles. 93 million miles. The light travels from the sun to the planet Earth in four minutes. That's the speed of light. Now, the whole solar system has distances within the solar system of four billion miles. Four billion miles within our solar system. You can imagine uh, the planet Earth when you are four billion miles away. It will look real tiny. Now let us consider the solar system within our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. So I'm going to erase this. Okay, if this is the solar system, and the planet Earth is in there somewhere, so the planet Earth can be uh, represented by a dot. Now, the Milky Way galaxy has millions of stars, and remembering that the light travels from the sun to the earth in four minutes, 93 million miles. Imagine this, from here to the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, the light will take not four minutes, not a year, not a thousand years, it will take 30,000 years at the speed of light to go to the edge. So here's the planet earth, and if we go to the edge, of our Milky Way galaxy, it will take us 30,000 years. Excuse me. At the speed of light to get to the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. Can you imagine? Now, if you are at the border of the Milky Way galaxy, how big is the planet Earth? Rather, how tiny is it? It will be sub-microscopic, real tiny, relatively. So let us now look, let us erase this and look at the Milky Way galaxy. Let us make it real tiny. This is the Milky Way galaxy, right here. And somewhere in there, this dot is actually this dot right here is actually too big for the solar system because we're talking about 30,000 light years across. This distance here, remembering that the light comes to us from the sun 93 million miles in four minutes. so. If we say this is the solar system, you can imagine the planet Earth in there somewhere. So this is the Milky Way galaxy now. And our universe contains one billion of these galaxies. One thousand millions like the Milky Way. Within our universe. So, the distances within our universe reach up to 26 billion light years. Twenty-six billion light years within our universe. From the sun to the earth, we have 93 million miles. 
and the light takes four minutes to get to us from the sun. Can you imagine distances of 26 billion light years? Where are the four minutes within this distance, the four light minutes? These are 26,000 millions of light years within our universe. So now let, let me erase this and draw our universe. Okay, here is the Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way galaxy, the, our universe. This is all, of course, distorted because we don't have enough board. But uh, when you are at the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, the planet Earth is very tiny. And when you go all the way to the border of our universe, where is the planet Earth? Do you remember where the planet Earth is? Very minute. Well, this universe is the smallest and innermost of seven universes. Seven universes, not one. And our universe is the smallest and the innermost of the seven universes. We have seen how vast our universe is with 26 billion light years within our universe. The second universe is much bigger. The third universe is bigger than the second. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh universe. Our mind cannot imagine the size of the seventh universe that encompasses the other six universes. This is why in the last program we decided that the circumference of the seventh universe cannot be described mathematically in terms of miles or light years. Infinity is the best description of the circumference of the seventh universe. And now we get to know who God is. This will correct the concept of God in the minds of millions of people because God is holding the seven universes in his hand. This is what the proven statement in the scripture says. In the Quran, chapter 39, God tells us that he is holding the seven universes in his hand. How much space do you have within the fist of your hand? And God is holding these vast distances, these vast universes within his hand. Where is the planet Earth in there? How significant is it? It is very important and very relevant to this program to understand who God is and how minute and insignificant the whole planet Earth is within God's kingdom. This illustration gives us some idea about the greatness of God and who God is. And I assure you, we didn't even come close. But we do have a better idea, and this corrects the concept of God in the minds of millions of people. God is great not only in terms of size, but also in terms of controlling everything every atom in the heavens and the earth down to subatomic levels. And this is a direct quotation from Quran. We learn from the scripture that God is the most gracious, the most merciful. God is love. He loves his creation. And you notice that I started this program by saying in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. And this brings the inevitable question. When we look around us all over the world, 
we see a lot of misery, a lot of famine, starvation, poverty, accidents, earthquakes, problems, diseases, cancer. The world is full of problems. The vast majority of the world is under dictatorship, oppression, and poverty. So the inevitable question that pops up in our minds, justifiably so, is if God is full of love and compassion and mercy, why all these problems? Why does God permit this famine, starvation, accidents and misery? It's a legitimate question. And this program will deal with this question. In order to answer the question 
Why are we here? And what is the purpose of our lives? We have to go back in time to where there was God and nothing else. Then God created the angels to perform functions where the existence of God is not necessary or simply devastating, as we will learn later on. The angels had to possess immense powers. And just to give you an idea, today the angels have to travel billions of light years in, uh, in only a few of our hours. They have to possess immense powers. And God gave the angels immense powers. We have heard uh, in the last few years about uh, questions like how many angels can dance on the tip of a pin? This kind of uh, silly question. But uh, the exact opposite is true. Just to give you an idea, one angel can hold the planet Earth in one hand. We know these things now after the discovery of the mathematical code and the mathematically proven statements in the scriptures. One of the angels became infatuated with his God-given powers. He had so much power that he thought he can be a God in his own right. That angel's name was Lucifer, or Satan, or the devil, or El Diablo. He has many names. Let us call him Satan for the purposes of this program. Satan, you can imagine Satan flying in the universe and saying to himself, I can be a god in my own right. I can rule part of this universe by myself. That was all in his head. And of course, his fellow angels had no idea what Satan was thinking. But God knew about Satan's supercilious thoughts deep in his head. God knew those thoughts. And there were two alternatives. Either God can simply wipe out Satan, and in this case, the angels will wonder, they will be perplexed. Why did God do this to Satan? Satan didn't do anything wrong. The other alternative was to expose Satan first. And to do this, God decided to create a tiny, a minute creature from a lowly material, mud. You can imagine the size of the human being compared to the size of an angel who can hold the planet Earth in his hand. So God created a tiny creature from a lowly material, mud. Then God ordered the angels to bow down before Adam, this tiny creature. They all did, except you know who, Satan. And thus, Satan was exposed as a rebel. Now the angels see for themselves that Satan is a rebel who deserves to be banished from God's kingdom. That was the first reason for creating the human race. It was mercy from God that he decided to expose Satan first by creating the tiny creature from mud, then ordering the angels to fall prostrate, bow down before Adam. The other reason for creating the human race is a bit more complicated. To understand this second reason, we have to go back to the time when Satan was infatuated with his power and saying, 
I can rule part of this universe by myself. I can be a god in my own right. God said to himself when he knew about Satan's supercilious thoughts, All right, you want to be a god? I will make you a god and see how good you are. There is much more to godhood than you think. This is what God thought to himself and this is where the second reason for creating us comes. In order to make Satan a god temporarily, God decided to give Satan a dominion and constituents. In order to be a god or a king, you have to have a dominion and constituents. To give Satan a dominion, God went out of his way to show Satan that the dominion God is giving to Satan is really tiny, minute. God created this vast universe, the seven universes that I described to you. And in this vast universe, God told Satan, I'm giving you this tiny, tiny planet Earth. This is your dominion. Okay, so now that Satan has his dominion, where will he get his constituents? That's right, the human race. God created the human beings and gave them the freedom of choice. God told us, you and me and every one of us, that if we choose Satan's kingdom, we belong in Satan's kingdom. And if we choose God's kingdom, then we belong in God's kingdom. Now this choice depends on siding with Satan's point of view or God's point of view. God's point of view is that God alone is Lord of the universes. He has no partners, no other gods besides him. This is God's point of view. And when you agree with this point of view, you belong in God's kingdom. Satan's point of view, on the other hand, is that God alone is not enough. There can be or there must be another God or gods besides him. And Satan wanted to be that other God. So the human beings have the freedom of choice and those among them who side with Satan's point of view become Satan's constituents. So now Satan has his dominion, the planet Earth, and his constituents, the human beings who side with his point of view. And Satan is being tested as a god. And the results are all around us. Now you know why the famine, the starvation, the misery, the accidents, the cancer, Satan's kingdom is plagued with these problems. On the other hand, these problems do not exist in God's kingdom. When you side with God's point of view, that is, decide that God alone is Lord of the universes, without any other idols in your life, you belong in God's kingdom, and God's kingdom has no cancer, no accidents, no headache, no problems. God's kingdom is characterized by perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect peace, perfect happiness. I know this sounds unbelievable, but you heard me right. God's kingdom is characterized by perfect health, perfect wealth, perfect happiness and joy. When you choose God's point of view, you belong in God's kingdom, and you will have no headache, no problems, 
No traffic tickets. I'm going to repeat that. You heard me right. When you belong in God's kingdom, you will have no headache. You will forget what headaches are. You will have no financial problems. No health problems. God runs the universes. And this is his law. If you belong in God's kingdom, there will be no accidents in your life. No misery. No marital problems. No problems of any kind. Unfortunately, the vast majority of people have sided with Satan's point of view. That God alone is not enough. They do this by idolizing, setting up idols like Muhammad or Jesus or Mary or San Francis or the boss or the dollar. They set up all kinds of idols. And when they do this, they uphold Satan's point of view and automatically they become Satan's constituents. Don't get me wrong, Satan is trying very hard to make his kingdom, the planet Earth, and his constituents, the people who choose him, and his point of view. He is trying very hard to make his kingdom a perfect kingdom. He wants very badly his constituents to enjoy perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect peace and happiness. But he just can't. And this is the whole idea. Satan is being put to the test with a dominion and constituents. And his incompetence as a god has been proven. And this is the whole idea of our existence. Some of you may think that I'm talking about some kingdom to come after life or something like that. But I'm talking about now, you and I. And some of you may ask, I didn't, I didn't want to be in this test, why am I here? Involuntarily. And this is a wrong question, because we learn from the scripture that is proven by mathematical code by physical evidence to be God's message to the world. We learn that you and I and every human being was asked whether we want the freedom of choice or not. We met God before the creation of the heavens and the earth. And we bore witness that He alone is our Lord. But this knowledge is obscured with this body. We cannot remember it now. We will remember it when we get rid of this body, this garment, and become free again. 
Well, I'm talking about now. Every human being you see is either a constituent of God or a constituent of Satan. And as I mentioned, constituents of God enjoy perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect happiness and joy. Now, in this world, Satan's constituents are plagued with problems, financial, marital, health. They have all kinds of problems. And I know this sounds unbelievable, but this is why I am repeating it. And I must repeat now that these statements are proven by physical evidence, by the mathematical code that I explained to you in the last episode. It is very important to realize that I'm not talking from the top of my head, that this is proven material by physical evidence that anyone can examine and verify. When you are in God's kingdom, when you side with God's point of view that God alone is Lord, without any idols, without Muhammad or Jesus or Mary or the saints, or the boss or the daughter, you belong in God's kingdom and you enjoy perfect life. When you side with Satan's point of view, here in this world, you suffer the consequences. What you see around the world is the consequence of Satan's incompetence as a God. God gave him this planet Earth and gave us the freedom to choose him and become his constituents. You know the scripture t tells us that if God wills, he can make all the people believers. Which is true. If God wills, he can make all the people on earth believers. The question is, why doesn't he? And the answer in the scriptures is, if God made all the people believers, where will Satan get his constituents to prove Satan's incompetence as a God? See, we are here to provide Satan with constituents. Those among us with our freedom of choice who choose Satan become his constituents by their choice. So this is happening here and now. Any human being you look at belongs either in God's kingdom or in Satan's kingdom. Whether they know it or not, there is no other choice. You either belong in God's kingdom or in Satan's kingdom. How can you tell? If you have any problems whatsoever, if you have headaches, financial problems, health problems, marital problems, any kind of problems, this will be your hint that you have made the choice to side with Satan's kingdom. Somehow, you will have to examine your own life. That is the difference between Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. God's king kingdom is characterized by perfect health, perfect wealth, and peace of mind. If you look into your life and find that your life is full of problems or has some problems, if you come to the conclusion that you have been victimized by Satan or duped by Satan into joining his kingdom, what is the way out? How can you join God's kingdom? How can I join God's kingdom? This is a very easy matter. At the same time, it is not so easy for the reasons that I'm going to explain to you. First of all, you have to come to a solid, unshakable conclusion that God alone is Lord of the universe. That 
No one besides God can help you or harm you. You have to come to this solid conclusion. So let us say you claim that you came to this conclusion, that you believe that God alone is Lord of the universe. The scripture tells us in Quran, chapter 29, verse 2, I'm going to quote it now. Do the people think that they will be left to say we believe without being put to the test? We will surely put them to the test to distinguish those who are telling the truth from the liars. Therefore, when you make this claim that you believe that God alone is Lord of the universe, you will have to be put to the test to show that you're not just offering lip service, that th this is a deep, solid, unshakable conviction. We read in the Bible that Job was put to the test. Satan inflicted a lot of harm upon Job. And this is my chance to tell you that any problems, any diseases, any accidents, any misery is inflicted only by Satan. God does not inflict any harm on his creation. kinds of disasters. The first kind is the admission tests, what I call admission tests. When you or I claim that we believe that God alone is Lord of the universe without any idols, we must be put to the test. These admission tests are designed to show that we uphold this conviction solidly, unshakably, under all circumstances, rich or poor, health or sickness. And admission tests are characterized by the fact that they do not leave permanent damage. They test you thoroughly. Then you are admitted into God's kingdom. That is the first kind of disaster. The second kind of disaster is called educational disaster. This is designed to bring us back into God's kingdom if we sway out of God's kingdom. If we make a mistake and step out of God's kingdom, this is exactly what happens. You step out of God's kingdom and Satan captures you, smites you, gives you a problem, a disaster. And this will be your uh, your attention getter. You will be alerted that you have stepped out of God's kingdom and you will come back fast. That is called educational disaster. And as you see, admission tests and educational disasters are inflicted by Satan. The third kind is called blessings in disguise. And uh, these appear to be disasters, but uh, when they are passed, you look back on them and you discover that they were actually good for you. Uh, you go apply for a job or something and uh, you don't get it. You flunk in the interview and you're very upset because you wanted that job. But later on you discover that uh, with time you obtained a better job and that had you succeeded in getting that job, it would have been much worse for you. So that is a blessing in, t in disguise. The fourth kind of disaster is retributive disaster. And it happens when a society or an individual reaches uh, the point of corruption where there is no reform. 
the point of no reform. A good example in the Bible and the Quran in the scriptures is Sodom and Gomorrah. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah were corrupted beyond reform. They became hopelessly trapped in their corruption. And God decided to inflict the retributive disaster that they deserved. And this is the only kind that uh, you may attribute to God, but actually it is, this ended their life. It was the final blow. And death is a fact of life, as you know. Everyone dies, so it is not really a disaster since it is the final act. Death is a fact of life. We all die, and that is not a disaster. So these are the four kinds of disasters. I remember a story that was told by a famous preacher about two men. One believed in God and the other did not. The man who believed in God was telling his friend, well, listen, if you don't believe in God, then if there is a day of judgment, you will be in deep trouble. But you see, if you believe in God, and then if there is a day of judgment, and you face God, you've got nothing to lose. If you don't believe in God, you're in trouble. But if you believe in God, and there is no day of judgment, and there is no God, you've got nothing to lose. Now this argument, the preacher said, uh, makes sense. It makes sense that you believe in God. But actually, I am here to tell you that it doesn't work that way. See, you cannot believe in God just in case there is a God. The only way is to reach deep, solid, unshakable conviction about God. Not only that God exists, but also that God is the only Lord of the universe. That there is no idol, no other God besides Him. And as I told you, it is very easy to make the switch from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom. All you need to do is to reach this deep conviction. You have many years to study, look around, research, think, reflect, and make a decision. And if you are fortunate to make a decision to join God's kingdom by believing that God alone is Lord of the universe, then you will be put to the test to show that you mean it, that it is not only lip service or just in case, as in that story. Your decision to join God's kingdom based on deep, unshakable conviction must be accompanied by repentance, remorse for the wrong things you have done in the past. You simply say to God, I'm sorry I did those things. I am sorry I did not side with your point of view that I fell into idol worship. I committed certain sins. I will never do them again. I repent to you. This repentance wipes out all your sins. You become like a newborn baby. No sins whatsoever. Better yet, we learn from the scripture that all your sins of the past will be transformed into credits. That's right, credits in your record. And credits means growth and development and strengthening of your soul. So on the day of judgment, you will be strong and able to withstand the energy of God, being close to God himself.
A lot of people ask the question, why the children are suffering? Why the innocent children are suffering? In the last few years, we have been watching in our living rooms, on the TV, children starving and dying in Africa. And uh, a lot of people are justified in asking why the children. It is very important to point out that when we side with Satan's point of view, we move ourselves and our families out of God's kingdom into Satan's kingdom. We and our families become constituents in Satan's kingdom and subject to Satan's incompetence as a temporary God. This is why the children are suffering. On the other hand, the suffering and death of those children is actually a blessing in disguise. When we study the scripture carefully, we realize that these children are going straight to heaven. And it is indeed a blessing for them. They actually do not die. They move on from this life to a much better life. The chances of those children growing up and making the right choice, siding with God's point of view, the chance is very nil that they will do that. And it is far better for those children to die now and go to heaven than to suffer for a long time and then end up not making it and ending up in an eternal hell. This brings us to a very important item in this episode, the unforgivable sin. You see, at the end of our term in this world, at the time of death, murder is forgivable. Adultery is forgivable. Stealing is forgivable. Lying, cheating, all these are forgivable sins. There is only one unforgivable sin when maintained until the time of death. This one unforgivable sin is idol worship. We fully appreciate now why idol worship is the only unforgivable offense. Because now we realize that the whole idea behind our existence, the whole idea behind creating us is to provide certain with the constituents who agree with his point of view that God alone is not enough, that there can be other gods, other idols besides God. The grossness of idol worship can be appreciated when you remember what I mentioned earlier in this program, that this planet Earth is a tiny, tiny component in God's kingdom. Remember when I mentioned that the planet Earth is 93 million miles from the sun, that the light from the sun to the planet Earth takes four minutes to reach us, 93 million miles from the sun to the Earth. And this is a very tiny distance when we think of the whole solar system being something like four billion miles across. And you can see the planet Earth diminishing in these vast distances. Now, the light comes to us from the sun in four minutes. But from the edge of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, the light takes not four minutes, not four days, not four years, not four centuries, and not four thousand years either. It takes 30,000 years for the light to travel 
from the planet Earth to the edge of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Can you imagine how tiny the planet Earth is in the Milky Way galaxy? And I mentioned that before. Our universe contains one billion galaxies like the Milky Way and distances up to 26 billion light years from the Sun to the planet Earth the light takes four minutes if you travel at the speed of light you reach the Sun in four minutes you reach the outer limit of the Milky Way galaxy in 30,000 years you reach the outer limit of our universe in 26,000 million years at the speed of light so where is the planet Earth in our universe? It is almost nothing. Now our universe, as I mentioned, is one of seven universes. The other six are much larger universes, if you can imagine that. So the planet Earth is terribly insignificant. Now, on this tiny, insignificant planet Earth, a man named Muhammad walked for 63 years. All his life from birth to death was 63 years. On this tiny, insignificant planet Earth, there was this human being, Muhammad. And millions of people around the world idolize him against his will. Can you imagine the grossness of this idol worship? On this tiny, minute, insignificant planet Earth, a man named Jesus, a creature of God, walked on the earth for 33 years. So how significant is he? How significant is Muhammad? And you can imagine, you can appreciate the grossness of idol worship when people idolize creatures of God like Muhammad or Jesus or Mary or the saints who walked on this earth for a limited period of time. And this planet earth, as you see, the whole planet earth is terribly insignificant. So now, with the study of the scriptures and the physical evidence supporting it, we come to appreciate that the only unforgivable offense is idol worship. God is holding the seven universes in his hand. And we see now that our purpose in life to be successful is to side with God's point of view that he alone is enough. God describes his greatness in the scriptures for us to appreciate God and to see that he alone is Lord. And, we, and to see and appreciate the grossness of idolizing anyone else. The definition of idol worship, by the way, is that if you believe that anyone other than the one who created you can benefit you, then you have fallen into idol worship. This is the definition of idol worship. If you believe that anyone other than the one true God, the one, the specific one who created you, if you believe that anyone other than God can benefit you, then you have fallen into idol worship. sure you realize that we cannot cover these heavy subjects in such a short time. I have shared with you the ideas about the king of chaos. We know now who the king of chaos is. We know why the world is full of miseries, famine, wars, oppression, disasters, accidents, 
cancer, etc. And we dealt with the most important question in anyone's life, the purpose of our life. Why are we here? Why were we created? And because these subjects are so heavy, I am sure I raised more questions than answered. And this is why I hope you will get on the phone and call me with your questions. Don't hesitate to ask. My phone number is area code 602-791-3989. I am going to put the address and the telephone number on the screen for you. So please write or call. My address is 739 East 6th Street, Tucson, Arizona, 85719. And the telephone is area code 602 791 3989. Thank you and God bless you.